Hey guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. As you probably know, keeping two or more boas together in the same enclosure, also known as cohabitating, is one of the most controversial topics in reptile keeping. And if you ask if you should cohabitate your boas on any of the social media forums, chances are you're, you're gonna get ripped a new one by an army of virulent keyboard warriors. But is cohabitating always wrong? That's the topic I'm gonna explore today. Could there even be some potential benefits to cohabitating? I'm also gonna tell you about an experience I had recently where I cohabitated two boas in the same enclosure and let you know what happened. So be sure to stay tuned for that. So first of all, I wanna make it clear, this is not a video where I'm telling everybody they should cohabitate all their animals and that it's a great idea and that bad things aren't necessarily gonna happen. For the vast majority of boa keepers, for the vast majority of situations, keeping boas one per enclosure is probably the best choice. And there are a number of reasons for this, of course, when you put two boas in the same enclosure, negative things can happen that can result in the harm to one or more of the animals. The most obvious is if one of them has a dominance over the other one, and the other one it feels a lot of stress because of it. Uh, even if the boa doesn't show the signs of stress, there could be some stress leading to a health issue, and it might not be clear until the boa, it might be even too late. So in general, you should not put two boas together. Of course, there can also be other unintended consequences if you make the really bad mistake of feeding two or more boas together. They can both grab the same rodent and one can end up eating the other, or one can just simply eat the other because it's hungry. Or even if you put two boas, a male and a female together, you could have an unintended breeding leading to babies, which you might not want to have brought into the world that you have to find new homes for. So a number of reasons why you should not cohabitate boas most of the time for most of the people. So I don't want anybody saying, well, Brian Boas said I could cohabitate boas, therefore I'm gonna do it. Um, a lot of people will cohabitate because they ran out of space and they wanna get more animals, but they only have a certain number of cages and a certain number of space. And if you put two boas in each cage, you can double the number of animals. But that's really a terrible idea. Uh, you shouldn't do this uh, just simply because you wanna get more boas and you've run out of space. The most common reason to cohabitate boas, of course, is for breeding them. And it's pretty much impossible to breed boas without keeping them together in the same cage. And my own uh, situation, I'm basically cohabitating males and females during the breeding season for somewhere around three up to five months of the year. I do give them breaks every month or so. I separate them to feed them, but then they're back together. And honestly, I haven't had any negative things happen uh, with regard to cohabitating in this fashion. There, you know, there's always the chance when you breed animals that there could be a negative consequence. You know, one of them could attack the other, leading ultimately, you know, the worst case scenario to the death of the other one. I had one situation where I put together um, uh, my two, a pair of red tails They'd already been together. I had separated them for feeding, waited about a week, put them back together, and the female thought she was getting fed again, and she went for the male and grabbed them and constricted, and you know, obviously I was quite distraught, and uh, she actually let go, though. After she realized it wasn't food, she ended up letting go, which was great. But, you know, in the worst case scenario with breeding, the uh, breeding itself, one animal can turn on the other. And, you know, usually it's an accidental, but uh, one of them could end up dying. You know, which of course there's all, all sorts of risks to animals with breeding. So um, it's just something you have to accept if you're gonna be breeding. But other than that example I told you, I've never had any negative things happen putting the animals together solely from the cohabitation during breeding. And in fact, there are some people who recommend cohabitating permanently for breeding. So their strategy is they just keep they're suitable pairs together year round, the male and the female. You know, some of them probably separate them for feeding. Some may even feed in the same enclosure, which I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But uh, in general, they seem to think that this works in some cases where they've done this. Um, you know, and it does have some advantages because you don't really, really need to worry about the window of seasonality for breeding. You just keep your males and females together. You let nature take its course. When they're ready to breed, they'll breed. 
Okay, maybe they breed every other year. You know, maybe they might breed every year if they are in physical shape. But it's really up to nature and what their biology will allow. You know, in some cases you might not want this because you want to kind of have more control over the breeding. You may not want to breed every year, which, you know, I would not recommend breeding every year, especially for the females. But, you know, for people who practice this type of breeding, it seems to work okay and they don't report any negative consequences from this. Cohabitating is obviously called for when breeding, but what about in non-breeding situations? Is it ever okay to cohabitate? And recently I tested this because I actually did cohabitate a few of my animals that were not in breeding trials. I have uh, several really nice hog island boas that I'm growing up. These are all females and a few, few males, I actually didn't house the males together, but I have a few females that are a few years old, including this one and I was cleaning cages and I decided I wanted to thoroughly clean one of my racks and scrub out all the enclosures and put in fresh substrate and I actually ran out of time and I couldn't get back to it so I ended up with not having enough cages that were ready to go for my animals so I thought well, you know what I might as well just try this you know I, I was not really worried about the risks these animals are really uh, docile and you know I haven't seen any signs of aggression uh, you know so I, I very um, carefully introduced the two together and I did this with two pairs actually so I had four animals cohabitating they are in an enclosure that has plenty of space and there are plenty of hiding places and the animals from what I could tell just basically ignored each other you know they would sometimes be coiled together over the hot spot maybe you know enjoying the heat together I'm not you know implying that they had any kind of social connection although I can't definitively say that they didn't but often they were just in separate hiding places on in different areas of the enclosure and they just ignored each other and I never saw any behavior that would suggest that anything you know malevolent was going on they all continued to feed fine and I actually separated them for feeding and that was one of the reasons why I ended up not continuing with this practice. It was really a pain to separate the animals because I would have to reach in there and, you know, you have two animals and they can sense that they're about to be fed. So, you know, it's more likely that they're going to bite me because of, you know, thinking they're going to be fed. And I would have to take one out, put it in a, uh, another enclosure or another receptacle, not an enclosure, just to hold it while I'm feeding the other one and then go back and then I would have to reverse it and take the other one out etc and that was kind of a pain it took a lot more time and um, it's probably a little bit more stressful for the snakes it was certainly more stressful for me and but you know the animals fed fine I never saw any kind of you know negative thing or any sign of any negative thing happening from this um, I ended up like I said I stopped doing it because it was just too hard to keep track of the feeding and then the shed sometimes an animal would shed and I wasn't quite sure which one shed and I like to have records of all my sheds per each animal so that made it a little more difficult as well and so I as I mentioned I always separated them for feeding I think obviously one of the main times when cohabitating can go wrong is when you're feeding animals because there's always a chance that one of them can or both of them can grab the same food item and one can eat the other which could ultimately result in the death of both of them so you know absolute disaster but i just wanted to relate an experience i had uh, not that long ago at a major reptile zoo i'm not going to tell you which one it is but a major reptile zoo in the u.s and they have a snake house with well over 100 snakes in there and my family went there on vacation and we're walking around and it happened to be feeding day in the snake house and almost all of the enclosures were cohabitation situations typically they would have the same species but they'd have multiple individuals of the same species in a cage they had a few enclosures that had multiple species not just snakes sometimes they would have snakes um, one enclosure even though it was a snake house they had like some big pythons or some you know larger snakes and there were actually tortoises on the bottom which i thought was kind of interesting but apparently it worked okay for them but they were feeding the animals and i remember seeing a enclosure with about three or four pretty large anacondas green anacondas they were in the six to ten foot range 
And so rather than separate them for feeding, they just put multiple rodents in there. And so they put like four or five rats, large rats in the enclosure with the anacondas. Luckily they didn't have them in a pile. They had them kind of separated through the enclosure. And the anacondas would just go over and kind of casually, you know, sniff it with their tongue. And then they would just casually kind of start eating and, you know, not like a boa that strikes and is like, you know, extremely uh, uh, fast and, you know, really wants to get that food. They just kind of seemed a little nonchalant about it. They started eating and, you know, um, I think all but one of them were eating a rodent when I was watching. One of them didn't seem to have any interest, but I think they put enough rodents in there so that was, there was at least one rodent per animal. And um, I didn't see them carefully monitoring to make sure that two snakes weren't eating the same rodent. And of course I was watching, but um, at the time I thought, well, this is really a bad idea. You know, a lot of negative things could come from this, but apparently this is how they do it at the zoo. And I would imagine if they had negative consequences resulting in injury to some of their expensive animals, they wouldn't continue to do this. So. You know, apparently they've been doing, I would guess they've been doing this for a while and they haven't had any negative things happen. It doesn't mean they're not going to have a negative thing happen, but apparently it works for them. I even saw another enclosure with rattlesnakes. I forget what species of rattlesnake, but they, this is the same thing. They had like multiple rodents in there. There were multiple snakes and most of them were eating a rodent just kind of casually. So who knows? Um, not, I would not, definitely not recommend this. As you know, I'm not trying to condone this behavior, but zoos apparently do this. Um, and it should be noted that many, many zoos do cohabitate. In fact, it's pretty rare that you go to a zoo and you see an enclosure with just one animal. You know, sometimes it's multiples of the same species. Sometimes you have multiple species. I've even seen enclosures in zoos where they've got mammals, birds, and reptiles all together, which is kind of interesting. I think part of this is because it kind of recreates the natural environment more. People, are, you know, who come to the zoo, they want to see these naturalistic enclosures with multiple species. Um, but you have to imagine, you know, I know a lot of people look down on zoos, but in general, zoos do look out for the welfare of their animals, not just for PR, but because they, you know, a lot of the people legitimately care and they want the animals to do well and reproduce. So they're not going to do something that's going to jeopardize that the majority of times. So I would have to imagine that if zoos had lots of negative things happening from the cohabitation, they wouldn't do it nearly as much. But, you know, next time you're at a zoo, look at the cages and I guarantee most of them will contain multiple animals, often of multiple species. So something to think about. One more point to consider when it comes to cohabitation is that there are many examples in the wild where snakes will naturally cohabitate. And if you look at snakes that overwinter in dens, such as garter snakes and rattlesnakes, you'll have several dozen to several hundred animals coming together in a communal situation. And they do derive quite a few benefits from this. Obviously they can conserve heat this way and they get safety in numbers from potential predators. But there is some recent research which also suggests that they may acquire additional social benefits. So just because we can't see the potential benefits that a SPOA has by cohabitating doesn't mean that there's not necessarily something that we're not seeing because you know there's so little understood about boas specifically their behavior that you know there could be all kinds of things going on so again i don't necessarily want to use this information to support cohabitating but i think that people should maybe be a little bit more open-minded especially on social media before they rip someone apart for just asking about the possibility of doing something and um, I don't spend a lot of time on social media other than YouTube, obviously, but as far as Facebook, Instagram, it's just not worth getting caught up in these types of debates. Uh, I've seen a lot of people are doing something that goes against what the majority of these, you know, keyboard warriors uh, de de deem is it okay. And often they go to these forums and they ask about it. I'm not quite sure why, because if they've already decided that they're going to do this, you know, they, they understand and they thought about it, they should just do it, but they go and ask about this type of behavior and they, um, it just leads to these ugly discussions that aren't really that productive. So um, anyway, I just, I just would consider that you have an open mind. 
and maybe don't rip people apart so much if you don't really understand their situation. So that's my take on cohabitation, something that probably shouldn't be done by the majority of people the majority of times, but also probably not quite as bad as many of the keyboard warriors on social media make it out to be. Now I'd like to hear what you think about cohabitation. Have any of you guys had experiences with cohabitation? Have there been any negative consequences? Are you so anti-cohabitation you're never going to watch my videos again? Let me know in the comments below. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please shoot them out to me and I'll do my best to get back to you. Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.